We're going to read from Matthew. Matthew um, chapter 9, verses 35. I'm going to go into chapter, nine, uh, chapter 10. Oh yes, two chapters. Not all of them, don't worry. Uh, and end at verse 23. If you've got one of these Bibles, which I think I'm the only one. Wow, because you've all got it with you on your phones and so forth. But anyway, if you do hold one of these, it's 974. In everyone else's Bible, you'll have to find out for yourself. Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and illness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed, harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Jesus called the twelve disciples to him and gave them authority to drive out impure spirits and to heal every disease and illness. These are the names of the twelve apostles. I should have given this reading to somebody else, shouldn't I, with lists of names. <laughs> Simon, who is called Peter, his brother Andrew, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, James, son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus, Simon the Zealot and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. These 12 Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Do not go among the Gentiles or enter any town of the Samaritans. Go rather to the lost sheep of Israel. As you proclaim this message, the kingdom of heaven has come near. Sorry, as you go proclaim this message, the kingdom of heaven has come near. Heal those who are ill. Raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. Do not take any gold or silver or copper to take with you in your belts, no bag for the journey or extra shirt or sandals or a staff, for the worker is worth his keep. Whatever town or village you enter, search there for some worthy person and stay at their house until you leave. As you enter the home, give it your greeting. If the home is deserving, let your peace rest on it. If it is not, let your peace return to you. If anyone will not welcome you or listen to your words, leave that home or town and shake the dust off your feet. Truly, I tell you, it will be more bearable for Sodom and Gomorrah on the day of judgment than for that town. I'm sending you out like sheep among wolves. Therefore, be as shrewd as snakes and innocent as doves. Be on your guard. You'll be handed over to the local councils and be flogged in the synagogues. On my account, you'll be brought before governors and kings as witnesses to them and the Gentiles. But when they arrest you, do not worry about what to say or how to say it. At that time, you'll be given what to say, for it will not be you speaking, but the spirit of your father speaking through you. Brother will betray brother to death and a father his child. Children will rebel against their parents and have them put to death. You'll be hated by everyone because of me, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. When you are persecuted in one place, flee to another. Truly, I tell you, you will not, going, you will not finish going through the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. Well, the reality is followers of Jesus have been persecuted from the very beginning. From Roman authorities and emperors to British kings and queens, faith in Jesus, or the wrong sort of faith in Jesus, could endanger your life. And here at the beginning of this mission movement, Jesus gives his followers early warning. Families will be divided. You'll be dragged before leaders. I'm a bit concerned about the reference to local councils, having worked for, for the council in, in, my, in my past. But yes, you'll be brought before <laughs> authorities. You'll be hurt, hated, and some of you will be killed because of my name. Because of my name. No one can say, Jesus... You never told me it would be so hard following you. And yet he calls us to follow. In our nation, 
Well, to be honest, we have known inconvenience as worshippers and ridicule at times. We are blessed to be able to meet free from fear. And we've heard stories this morning of people who do not have that privilege. And yet they choose to follow. It is worth mentioning we need to be careful where we get our news from. There are stories often circulating in social media about recent massacres of Christians. Some of these stories, to be honest, are rehashed rumours that have been spreading around whenever large uh, conflicts occur in the Middle East. Sometimes the stories you will read about a certain town are just repeats of a story that was circulating five years ago in a previous country. Persecution is real, but before you share something, check its authenticity. And you may find it's an old, old story with some of the names changed and then sent out on social media, set in a very different country. The stories we've heard this morning have been verified and they're real. And you know what strikes me about these stories? They share something. They share a very simple pattern. Did you notice that their faith in Jesus was active? It was a true following after Jesus. And they instinctively joined Jesus on mission. As if they'd been sent out. Their family was changed. Their communities were changed. They were missionaries without necessarily knowing what that meant. And we can see that pattern here in the Bible, in our reading this morning. Jesus has already called his first disciples. So this isn't a calling of his first disciples. He'd already done that. And they follow him, and then very shortly afterwards, they are sent. These 12, Jesus sent out. And then it lists them, and you heard that. And then Jesus said to them, See, I am sending you out like sheep in the midst of wolves. The thing is, these stories we heard today, they're not from missionaries we sent to the U- from the UK to these countries. They are from followers of Jesus who seem to know they are sent to their own. They are workers in the harvest. Because to follow Jesus is to be sent. There is hidden or or not so hidden in this passage a a, a subtle shift in identity of the 12 followers of Jesus listed. And I don't know if you can spot it. Did did anyone spot the the subtle shift in labelling of the followers of Jesus? That's okay. Took me a while. In verse 1, he summoned his 12 disciples and he gave them authority. In verse 2, the author of this passage writes, these are the names of the 12 apostles. It's like, where did that word come from? They were disciples. And then verse 2, they are apostles. Now, a disciple is a follower of Someone who learns from from the master, a mentor or a teacher. So I'm a I'm a disciple of who who would I be? I'm trying to think of an an earthly representation here. Um, I'm a I'm a disciple of uh, some of the the best pro cyclists. I, I try and follow them. I learn from them. In fact, I was watching a YouTube video about what to eat as a pro cyclist. So in a way, I'm kind of a disciple, although I've never met them, of some of the pro cycling teams. And don't worry, I'm not there yet. I'm not that good yet. And I need to talk to Donna about my dietary requirements, but that's a different matter. (laughs) So a disciple is someone who follows, who tries to kind of, you change your life based on the guidance of mentors and teachers and rabbis and leaders. An apostle is different. An apostle is someone who is sent. An apostle is an envoy, a messenger, an ambassador. 
It came to mean later on an eyewitness of Jesus. So they would often describe the apostles as those who would actually witness Jesus in the flesh or in visions. But the original meaning and the meaning here, I'm pretty sure of it, is an envoy, an ambassador, a sent one. You know, one, of my, one of the joys of, 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 be, of being your minister is that I'm, a, I'm your representative whether you like it or not. I'm your representative in the community. So, so I was at Paris Castle for some, for some uh, reason and somebody came out and said, oh, you're, you're, the, you're, the, you're, you're the reverend, aren't you? Where are you from? So I had to explain. And I represented you in that moment to that person who worked at Paris Castle. When I go to, to ministers' conferences back before the pandemic, the first one I went to in Saundersfoot, People would say, where are you from? Welshpool. Welshpool Baptist. Yeah, Welshpool Baptist Church. I'm, I'm their new minister. I represent you. So I have to behave. <laughs> to the community and to my friends. I was speaking with somebody the, the other day and I was telling them, you know, about, about, about you folks. In fact, she, she, tur she turned up here last week from the forest. Uh, and then I invited her over for coffee because she, she, we, we used to know each other from the forest. And I, I represented you to her because she knew me and she didn't know you. I was your representative. And do you know what, it's a joy. And the reflection there is, is the local councils. I used to work for Herefordshire Council. And do you know what? I was a representative of Herefordshire Council, whether I liked it or not. I went out sometimes to do site visits on planning applications. And I, I didn't want to speak with the people. I just wanted to see what was going on and see if it had been doing and, and to make sure that the address was correct. And somebody, oh, you're from the council. And that would be that. <laughs> you know, that, that begins a whole different conversation than you're the minister of Wellspool Baptist Church. I promise you, I was the representative of the council. They, they didn't care that I wasn't the council leader. As far as they were concerned, I was the council. So I had to hear about their complaints about what Herefordshire Council had or hadn't done. I represented Herefordshire Council. And as your minister, I represent you as a community, us as a community of believers. And you could say, well, yeah, we pay you that. You should do that. Yes. But do you know what the deciding factor in representing you is? The big factor in representing you is you called me. That's it. You know, as a Baptist minister, you don't officially become ordained and a reverend until a church calls you. It's the call of God discerned by you as a church that makes me your representative. To my friends, to my colleagues, and to my community. Here, Jesus calls his disciples, he gives them authority, and he sends them out as his ambassadors, his apostles. They represent Jesus. So are you an apostle? Have you ever considered yourself an apostle? Maybe you consider yourself a disciple, but are you an apostle? Not simply of Wellspool Baptist Church, or of Herefordshire Council, <laughs> but of Christ. Let's go through the qualifications again, shall we? And then you can make your mind up whether you're an apostle or not. The first qualification is you are called to follow Jesus as his disciple because that's the qualification that these these folk had here some of the language we use to describe becoming christian or a convert can actually distract us from this call to follow now i've used all sorts of language to describe what it means to come to know jesus and it's not wrong so i'm not criticizing anyone who might say these things but just remember does it distract? So the kind of language that I've used in the past are welcome Jesus into your heart or, or accept Jesus as your personal saviour. This is all true. It's not a lie. That's true. That's what happens. But the writers of the gospel use very different language. And I could pick up you know, so many different uh, moments in the life of Jesus where this happens, but I've just picked two. Jesus said to Simon, don't be afraid. 
From now on, you will fish for people. So they pulled their boats upon the shore, left everything and followed. Now you could say, yes, he did welcome Jesus into his heart. Yes, he, he accepted as much as he knew that Jesus was saviour. But what did Jesus say? From now on, you will fish for people. What did they do? Followed. And then Jesus is talking to his disciples about the difficulty of, of their lives and, and how difficult it would be. And he said, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross and follow me. You are called to follow Jesus. That's the call that echoes through the Gospels. However you want to talk about it, that's the call that echoes through the Gospels. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, uh, a theologian, a priest, and uh, some, some would say he gave his life for what he believed in. He, he wrote about costly grace. And he's not talking about the cost for Jesus here. He's talking about the cost for us. And he writes this, costly grace is the treasure hidden in the field. For the sake of it, a man will go and sell all that he has. It is the pearl of great price to which the merchant will sell all his goods. It is the call of Jesus at which the disciple leaves his nets and follows him. Such grace is costly because it calls us to follow. And it is grace because it calls us to follow Jesus Christ. It is costly because it costs a man his life and it is grace because it gives a man the only true life Do you know i i appreciate that i can't say whether i love those words because they're, they're they're strong words but i appreciate those words it is costly because it costs a person their lives and it is grace because it gives the person the only true life Somehow, in giving up something, we receive something greater. That, according to Bonhoeffer, is costly grace. So that's the first qualification, and you've got to decide for yourselves whether you qualify. You are called to follow Jesus, and you choose to follow whatever the cost. That's the first qualification of being his ambassador, his envoy, his apostle. The second qualification, according to this, is you are given authority it would be, it'd be pretty awful if I was your representative, but I had no, no authority. And authority is a, is a word, isn't it, that can sometimes be, be misused or uh, people are afraid of. But actually, you give people authority. You allow them to do things. You give them freedom and responsibility to do things and to say things on your behalf. Jesus gives authority in order that people become apostles. This is what he said to those disciples. Do not go among the Gentiles or enter any town of the Samaritans. Go rather to the lost sheep of Israel. As you go, proclaim this message. The kingdom of heaven has come near. So Jesus says, you've got, you've got authority to say something. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons. Freely you've received, freely give. Now, in a way, that's a giving of gifts, but I, I also see it as authority to act like Jesus, I've done this, you have authority to do this. A little later on, Jesus says, all authority is in heaven and earth has been given to me. And then he says, go. It's this idea of authority being passed on to us. Jesus gives his, his followers authority to heal, to proclaim, to give as they've received from Jesus. So that's the second qualification. Have you been given authority? Well, I hope that, that answers it. The third qualification, you need to be sent. I am sending you out like sheep among wolves. Therefore, be as shrewd as snakes and as innocent as doves. Do we believe that we are sent? Do we believe that we are sent? And if so, where to? Is it to places like that? Well, I'm going to hazard a guess 90% of us, maybe 99% of us, it won't be. 
In fact, where were they sent? <laughs> to their families? To... That's the, the wonderful challenge of the sending of Christ, is that sometimes it would be easier for us to go, for, for us to, go to somewhere where nobody knew us and start life as a Christian, instead of having to live life as a Christian with those who know us well. So you've been called, do you believe that? You've been given authority, do you believe that? And you've been sent, have you heard that? These stories this morning that we've heard are from people who hold those qualifications and they are living in the reality of the persecution that Jesus described. Costly grace, costly grace. I once heard somebody at a conference say, you know, that one of the challenges about the Christian faith is that we don't, often we don't front load it when we're telling people about Jesus, of the challenges. And it's like we hide the challenges. And then when people face the challenges, they're like, wow, this isn't how it should be. He said, it's almost like we try and hide the cross from people, not just the cross of Christ, but the cross that people are called to carry. And so this morning, I'm not going to do that because Jesus didn't. To follow Jesus costs, but it is grace because you receive. Maybe we're thinking, you know, hearing those stories, I, I don't know about you, but there have been times in my life where the last thing I want to hear is a story of how successful somebody else is in mission, because I don't feel that way, right? That's, there are times in my life when I feel like that. Because we hear stories like that and we think that means I have to work harder or I have to be better or I have to have the gift of being able to communicate with people, you know, really easily. And, and you think and you feel guilty. I've felt that. Friends, what we've heard today is people, ordinary folk, some of them extraordinary, but to be honest, in, 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 generally speaking, ordinary folk, in their own communities, relating to people in their own ways, living out the gospel as best they can. People who are qualified, not because they are great public speakers, although I'm not saying they aren't, but because they are called, because they've been given authority, and because they are sent. I don't think it's a fact that they're working harder than anyone else. You know, we need to change our mindset. We, we need to commitment, yes, but a mindset that says, if only I worked harder, I would get different results by doing the same things. That's, I don't think that's how it always works. These people knew, know who they are and they know who Jesus is. There is a harvest parable that Jesus told about a farmer sowing seed and it's harvest. It wouldn't be right if I didn't mention it. But don't worry, we won't go into massive detail. The farmer sows some seed. And only some of it bears fruit. The farmer sows the seed and it falls on various parts of the field and on and near the path. It's just some random farmer, not a very skilled farmer from, from my recollection. It's just like, what a waste of seed. And some of it bears fruit. And some of it is lost or smothered. Following Jesus is not easy. Many will like the idea of faith in Jesus, but not the practice, not the reality. It will become one choice among many life choices. I'm, I'm, you know, this is one thing I do. Many will accept Jesus as saviour because they like the idea that he can save them, but they won't choose to follow him and it can become a shallow relationship and to me it doesn't seem one of discipleship and yet for those that do for, for, for that seed that, that falls on fertile ground for those who choose to follow he gives authority and he sends us as his workers in the harvest And so this morning, we end by praying, Lord of the harvest, send out workers into your harvest field.